This presentation, we will take a look at Matthew chapter 18 and Luke 10. We'll consider some items in each of these chapters. Again, I would read the chapters probably before watching that you'll know the storylines and the details and you'll probably get more out of it. Also, I saw some charts in this particular presentation on YouTube, so those listening in audio-only format, in a podcast format, uh, you can take a look at this on YouTube channel, Coming Unto Christ, by Michael S. Clough, if you want to see some of the slides that I'm referring to. So with that... Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. The disciples asked the Savior, Who is the greatest in the kingdom? And the Savior's reply is interesting and very instructive to all of us. He said, And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 18, 3. Now, notice he didn't say to become childish, but he said to become as a little child. Well, let's take a look. What does he mean? By that? What is it that little children have that make them the greatest that we as adults do not have? And maybe we can see what we're lacking and what we need to become in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In what way am I to become as a little child? Well, let's take a look at Doctrine and Covenants, section 29, verses 46 through 47, which read as follows. But behold, I say unto you that little children are redeemed from the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. Wherefore, they cannot sin, for power is not given unto Satan to tempt little children until they become begin to become accountable before that. And we know that through modern revelation that that is age 8. So verses, or sorry, so ages 1 through 8, little children because of the atonement, and Christ has redeemed them because they're not accountable. The atonement covers them and they are innocent. They are without sin. They are guiltless. They are not guilty of sin. I think this is what the Savior is trying to tell us. We need to become like that. Thus, little children are innocent without sin. So in order to return to the Father, I must become sin innocent without sin once again, which can only be accomplished by repentance through the atonement of Christ. So that's what he's trying to teach when he says become like little children. In other words, become innocent again. Become guiltless without sin. And since we are fallen after the age of accountability and we sin, the only way to do that is through repentance using the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 through 7, the Savior then gives a warning concerning these little children. He says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that they offenses come, but woe to any man by whom the offense cometh. Offending Christ's little ones, you are better off dead, drowned in the depths of the sea, than doing that. Do you catch the warning? I'd like to now read from you an article written January 24, 2003, by a man named John Whitehead, and it's entitled, Evil Walks Among Us. Child Trafficking Has Become Big Business in America is the title of his article. Here is just an excerpt, a few words from his article. Look at what he has found and the research has shown. It takes a special kind of evil to prostitute and traffic a child for sex. And yet this evil walks among us every minute of every day. Consider this. Every two minutes, a child is bought and sold for sex. 
Hundreds of young girls and boys, some as young as nine years old, are being bought and sold for sex as many as 20 times per day. On average, a child might be raped by 6,000 men during a five-year period. It is estimated that at least 100,000 to 500,000 children, girls and boys, are bought and sold for sex in the U.S. every year, with as many as 300,000 children in danger of being trafficked each year. Some of these children are forcefully abducted, others are runaways, and still others are sold into the system by relatives and acquaintances. Child rape has become big business in America. This is not a problem found only in big cities. It happens everywhere right under our noses in suburbs, cities, towns, and towns across the nation. As Ernie Allen of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children points out, the only way not to find this in any American city is simply not to look for it. Like so many of the evils in our midst, sex trafficking and the sexualization of young people is a cultural disease that is rooted in the American police state, state's heart of darkness. It speaks to a sordid, far-reaching corruption that stenches from the highest seats of power, government and corporate, down to the most hidden corners and relies on our silence and our complicity to turn a blind eye to wrongdoing. End of part of a segment of his article. Isn't that sickening? That this is happening to little children in the United States of America. What makes us think, brothers and sisters, for one second that the United States will escape the judgments of God for such evil. I hate to contemplate the destruction, scourges, and afflictions that are here and are coming to our nation because of these injustices to God's little ones. I apologize for the misspelling of R there. Brothers and sisters, the United States has a destiny with judgment of God because of the way we are treating God's little ones. It is a terrible thing, and Christ has warned us. We must do more and be better with the child trafficking that is going on amongst us and do all we can within our power to stop it. Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew 18, 8 through 10 tells us what the solution to this is. Verse 8, And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Verse 9, And a man's hand is his friend, and his foot also, and a man's eye are they of his own household. Verse 10, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. We are better off destroying the evil amongst us, comparing it to an eye or to a limb, than to let it to fester and to keep going. We must destroy this wickedness that is plaguing our society. There are scourges and judgments coming to this nation, brothers and sisters, that I don't think you and I have ever contemplated because of the wickedness that is being distilled upon our young children in America. Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. The Savior gives the parable of forgiveness and what our debt is to God and how much he really forgives. This is the parable where a king takes an account of his subjects and there is one who owes him 10,000 talents and he cannot pay it back. And so he begs forgiveness and the king forgives him. And then that man goes out and finds someone that holds, owes him 100 pence 
and won't forgive him and throws him in prison. And the king finds out and brings the man back and throws him into prison because he would not forgive as freely as the king did. Well, here are some things concerning that little parable that I gave just a quick overview of. You can read the details in verses 21 through 35 of 18. First of all, the rabbis of the day taught that you were required to give up to three times. So in these verses, when Peter says, should we forgive seven times, he is being quite generous above what the rabbis are teaching. And then, of course, as you know, the Savior comes out and says, no, you should seven times 70, which is another way of saying always. Not that we keep tally to 490, but that we always should forgive, just as the Savior is willing to forgive us, the great and mighty King, as many times as we are willing to repent. Just to give you a breakdown and what Christ was trying to teach with this parable about the 10,000 talents that this man owed, how much is 10,000 talents in today's money? I just did some quick calculations, and here they are. A talent from the Bible dictionary is 75.6 pounds. So 75.6 pounds is 1,209.6 ounces. As of March 2nd, 2023, the price of gold per ounce was $1,835.97. And so a talent, being 75.6 pounds, times 1,839 per ounce, comes out to $2,220,789.31. And so you take that and tens out by 10,000, that money that this man owed was $22,207,890,032. In other words, if the Christ was giving the parable today, the amount owed would be 22 gazillion. It's an astronomical amount that is beyond human comprehension, beyond human ability to pay back. That's how much we owe the Savior because of our fallen nature. If you want to put it in monetary terms and what it would cost to buy ourselves way back, buy ourselves back into the celestial kingdom, it would cost more than you could ever make in any amount of lifetimes. That's how much the man owe. That's how much we owe the Savior and our Father in heaven. If you paid 500 a month on it, it would take 37,013 years to pay off. Well, can you see? No wonder the servant is just a... Is, just a little anxious about this debt and begs for forgiveness. Can you see his anxiety? He knows there is no earthly way possible. And so he begs the king, please do not sell me and my family and put us into prison. Please. And so the king forgives out of the compassion of his heart. Well, how much was the hundred pence that the other man owed this man, his friend? A hundred pence are a hundred Roman denarii, the denarii being equal to seven pence, a half penny. A hundred days' wages of labor and soldier, enough to provide a mill for 2,500 men. as John chapter 6, verse 7, that talks about the pence. And so it is at a substantial amount. It would appear to be a considerable sum, but only when compared with the 10,000 talents does it look so absolutely insignificant. And he would not forgive his friend for that, even though the king had forgiven him of his debt. Do you see the point of the parable, brothers and sisters? 
because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven is willing to forgive us and enable us to return back into his kingdom through the atonement. And he's willing to forgive that debt and let Christ pay it. And then we pay Christ back through repentance. And yet we cannot forgive each other down here of our 100 pence, 100 pence little offenses. That's what all these offenses that we argue and, oh, I'm offended by someone in the world. Oh, I'm offended by this in the world. Oh, I'm offended by that. There are all these 100 little pence things. Christ is willing to forgive 10,000 talents worth, $22 billion worth. And we're griping and complaining over each other over 100 pence. Do you see why Father would be just a little upset? And maybe not willing to forgive us if we do not forgive others. We must get rid of the anger in our hearts towards others. Now those who do something wrong, they're still accountable for what they do. We're not talking about that. We're talking about forgiving and get rid of the anger in your own heart. If you want Father in Heaven to forgive you and let the atonement be effective in our lives. Well, let's turn to Luke chapter 10 now. Verses 25 through 37 is the famous story of the Good Samaritan. This is a well-known story that everyone knows, so I'm going to approach it a little bit different and give you a little different insight. The Good Samaritan is a type and shadow of the plan of salvation. Let me make that suggestion to you. You can read this as a type and shadow of telling the plan of salvation. John W. Welch, writing in BYU Studies, sees the story of the Good Samaritan as an extended allegory for the plan of salvation. Welch states, before modern Christians read this parable allegorically, with the Samaritan, for example, aptly typifying Christ, such a reading becomes even stronger when enriched by the full plan of salvation, which we have as Latter-day Saints in the restored gospel of the true church. Following is a table summarizing his types and shadows of the Good Samaritan as an allegory. So let's take a look. On the left, I have Luke chapter 10. We have different aspects of the story of the Good Samaritan. Then on the right, I have the type and shadow, using LDS language, of what this points to and what it is symbolic of. And notice how it just goes through the whole plan of salvation. First of all, there was a man that would be Adam or all mankind. He went down. That would be left pre-mortal existence. Went down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was considered the holy city, the presence of God. So Adam left mortal pre-existence into the, and from the presence of God. Then went to Jericho, a celestial world. That would be symbolic of the world now in which we live and fell, our fallen state, our sins. Adam fell that men might be. Among robbers, Satan expected trials that happen in mortality. We fall amongst robbers down here and against affliction and different trials that come because of mortality or because of the things Satan is trying to inflict upon the world. They stripped him. Stripping authority, the garment, losing immortality, wounded him. Symbolically, that would be blows of mortality. We get wounded down here. I don't know about how you feel, but boy, mortality just beats you up sometimes. And we get bruised and broken and wounded because of mortality. Departed. These robbers departed. 
required to depart. Uh, Satan cannot forever do things to us. Left him half dead to death. There's a physical death and a spiritual death. And so he's only half dead. He has just been wounded. By chance, meaning not by the original divine plan, but experiences of mortality. Some things happen because of by chance, because of that's how mortality works. So by chance, a priest and a Levite come by. Those with partial authority, a priest and a Levite only held the Aaronic priesthood. They passed by, meaning they lacked higher power to save. The Aaronic priesthood cannot save us and heal our wounds of mortality. Only the Melchizedek priesthood through the atonement can do that. Then a Samaritan comes. This would be symbolic of Christ, who was most humble, but yet was despised by most of the people, just like the Samaritans were. They and saw, knowing him and seeing all, Christ knowing all things and sees what we're going through down here. So the Samaritan saw and had compassion meaning the pure love of Christ. So far, we'll just pause right there and take a look at just the right size. Notice how this story is just describing the plan of salvation. Adam and all mankind must leave premortal existence, the presence of God, and come to a telestial world, and they'll end up in a fallen state where there will be expected trials and Satan's temptations will be here. We will be stripped of authority and lose immortality. We will become mortal because of the fall. The blows of mortality will wound us and cause great pain and suffering, but will not last forever, required to depart. And there are two deaths that must be overcome, physical and spiritual death. And not by the original plan, but because of experiences of mortality, we will have different experiences. Those with partial authority cannot save us, the ironic priesthood. They lack the higher power to save. Christ, who has the Melchizedek priesthood and is most humble but despised by his people, will come to help us and he will have the pure love of Christ. Continuing the parable, went to him, so the Samaritan went to him, that is symbolic of succoring us in our time of need. Christ will come to us. Bound his wounds, symbolic of a binding covenant. What will heal us of our wounds? It's our covenants and ordinances of baptism and in the temple that bind the Savior to us. DNC 82.10, I am bound when you do what I say. The binding of covenants. Pouring in, gushing forth and filling up. Oil, which is healing, anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oil is always usually symbolic of the Holy Ghost. How will he help heal us? and pour in oil in our wounds by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wine, he'll give wine, symbolic of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Again, how will he heal our wounds? By the power of the Holy Ghost and through the authority and power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. On, he, then he set him on his own beast, the symbolism, the body of Christ, triumphal rescue. Christ himself will take upon him us. He will take on him in his own body us. Like the Samaritan putting the man on the beast to take care of him. Then he takes him to an inn. 
This would be symbolic of the church, but it's not our final destination. And he took care of him. The innkeeper took care of him. Jesus personally cares for all. On the morrow, dawning of a new day, being born again. Two denaria, two days wages, which was the same as the annual temple tax. Christ will pay the price for us. The innkeeper that he asked to take care of till he comes back would be symbolic of any church leader who is now asked to be a shepherd and take care of the sheep. When I come again, second coming of Christ, when he comes again. So he has provided a way for us to be healed of mortality, of our wounds and our bruises, our cuts, all of that. He's provided a church for us to be taken care of, where Christ, through other people, and through leaders and ministering people and all sorts of things can take care of us. And then he will come again, the second coming. And then he will repay the innkeeper, meaning he will cover all costs and reward well. Those who serve in the church to take care of Christ's children will be rewarded well. Christ will cover all the costs that you and I expense that was paid to take care of others, whether that's monetarily, whether that's spiritually, whether that's emotionally, whether that's mentally, whether that's physically. Christ will repay. Do you see how beautiful this parable shows the whole plan of salvation? It is a type and an allegory of coming to mortality, being fallen, overcoming the fall through the atonement of Jesus Christ, which is the Melchizedek priesthood, not the Aaronic priesthood. That's why the priest and Levi just walked by. They could not help. It must take the great high priest, even Jesus Christ, to heal us of our sins and of our affirmities. And that Christ will then make sure there is an inn or a place where we can be watched over and taken care of. And he calls that his church. Yes, there are imperfect people in it, but that's okay. Because Christ can do perfect things with imperfect people if we will just follow him. And we will just focus on the Savior. And then he will repay all of those who served in his kingdom and he will repay them well. He will reward them handsomely, even with exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Well, thank you for watching. Hopefully some of those things helped in these chapters. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.